So hello and welcome to the Good Food Institute and Bright Green Partners joint webinar on our recent analysis focused on plant-based meat manufacturing capacity and pathways for expansion. My name is Priyara Panescu and I'm the lead plant-based scientist on GFI's science and technology team. I'll be providing a brief introduction before passing it over to my co-presenters from Bright Green Partners. In this webinar, we will summarize the analysis report starting with the analysis objectives and approach. We will discuss current plant-based meat manufacturing capacity at industrial scale. We will then share potential pathways for building manufacturing capacity before demonstrating the strong potential of retrofitting through discussion of a scenario analysis. Finally, we'll walk through some key conclusions and recommendations for industry and policy stakeholders. This analysis was a great effort between many authors and other contributors. The authors from GFI are Amanda Bess, Simone Costa, Daniel Gertner, and myself, Priyar Panescu. From Bright Green Partners, the authors are Flor Butelar, Heinrich von Jakovitz, Igor Viktorov, and Matteo Schweiger. We also extend our gratitude to the additional contributors and industry experts that lent their time, some of which are included on this slide. For those not familiar with us yet, the Good Food Institute is a 501c3 nonprofit that is developing the roadmap to secure, sustainable, and just protein supply. We are 100% powered by philanthropy and have earned Candid's 2022 Platinum Seal of Transparency. GFI has almost 200 team members around the globe, and we focus on three key areas. Our science and technology team works to advance foundational open access research and alternative proteins and create a thriving research and training ecosystem around these game-changing fields. Our corporate engagement team partners with companies and investors around the globe to drive investment, accelerate innovation, and scale the supply chain, all faster than market forces would alone allow. And finally, our policy team advocates for fair policy and public research funding for alternative proteins. GFI thinks about how we can sustainably create meat, considering global meat demand's projected growth. According to the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, we're expected to have to produce about 50% more meat than we currently do in 2050 to keep up with global demand. That totals to 557 million tons of meat. It's important to note that we have seen massive shifts in protein sources occur historically. Here we can see that poultry demand became, in, began increasing significantly in the 1980s and has far surpassed beef and pork growth. GFI believes that we are at the beginning stages of a similar protein revolution with plants and other alternative sources. It is especially important to consider plant proteins to reach projected meat demands because we know that a global protein transition is necessary to keep warming below 1.5 degrees Celsius and meet the Paris Agreement's climate goals. For more information on this food system transition, please explore GFI's report with climate advisors shown on the left of the slide. Plant-based meats offer a large variety of choices that can substitute conventional meat products like beef burgers, ground beef, pork sausage patties, and breaded chicken, while significantly reducing their environmental footprint. For example, we see the popular Impossible Burgers production utilizes 96% less land, 87% less water, while reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 89% and aquatic eutrophication by 91% compared to a beef patty. Given these impressive environmental advantages, a protein transition that includes plant proteins as meat substitutes has strong, uh, could provide a significant climate change solution if produced and consumed widely. Last year, GFI released a report in which we explored the anticipated production requirements for plant-based meat in 2030. Using estimates from third-party market research groups, we applied the hypothetical scenario that assumed 6% of the global meat market would comprise of plant-based meats in 2030. With this, the authors estimated that at least 810 factories would need to be operational by 2030 to hit production targets. The greenfield construction for these facilities was estimated to cost roughly $27 billion in capital expenditure. Given these results, GFI wanted to dive deeper and capture how current manufacturing capacity is utilized and distributed, as well as understand the opportunities retrofitting facilities offer for capacity build out. We collaborated with Bright Green Partners to explore these pathways. And with that, I'll hand the pre presentation over to Giza 
Molnar, co-founder and managing partner of Bright Green Partners. Hey, thanks a lot. Thanks for the nice intro and excited to be here and welcome everyone. We, we have so many people in the audience. And um, again, I'm Geza Molnar. I'm one of the co-founders and managing partners of Bright Green Partners. And this is just a quick slide on what we do when um, we're not making studies with GFI. So I, I thought it's worth covering it. And then in a second, we will also dive into the study. So if you don't know us, we are a management consultancy and we cover uh, alternative proteins, both plant-based fermentation and cultivated. On the slide, you can see uh, a bit more about our approach, but just very, very quickly, we cover the full supply chain uh, of alt proteins from upstream to downstream. And we offer a wide range of services, typically for large corporations and, and also for governments and, and larger investment firms. Um, we do some of the very classical services, anything from scouting to due diligence to, to, uh, to ingredient sourcing. But what I wanted to mention here today that is also very relevant for this study and, and for, for this specific audience is we, we typically help large uh, corporations and also governments when it comes to their production strategy. So this can be anything from optimizing previous strategy all the way to to setting up new strategy for new ingredients, new products. And this can mean anything from um, um, creating, this can include anything from creating a, a new factory or, or optimizing or refurbishing old factories, um, which again is also relevant for this study. Uh, some of our clients have a few facilities and, 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 for, and perhaps they just need an optimization. Some other clients have a whole network of facilities and, uh, um, and they need our services. Yeah, so again, uh, welcome everyone to this uh, webinar. We're excited to dive into the, to the content of the, of the study. And now I will just hand it over to my colleague, Heinrich, who was the project manager on Bridegroom Partners end of this study. Yes, thank you, Giza, for the introduction. As a first step, I want to explain a bit in a bit more detail the approach that we took before this analysis. First of all, clarifying the scope. So we pro focus in the study on plant-based meat. So not, not on dairy, not on anything else. And in terms of the value chain for, of plant-based meat, which starts with farming and then ingredient production, we focus on the last two steps being processing uh, for the production of structured plant protein, SPP, which usually is done by extrusion. And then the post-processing, which results then in the final product that the consumer will, will eat. And on the processing step, we are looking both at uh, low moisture extrusion and on high moisture extrusion. We are excluding all other methods of producing a structured plant protein, but the Two extrusion methods are probably covering most of the production today. Then in terms of the approach we took for the analysis in the study, as a first step, we have looked at the production capacity in the market in 2022. And the first uh, to get at that, we have looked at the actual production in 2022 and also at the free capacity to understand the status quo. Second step then is to look at how capacity could be increased. And we have spoken to a lot of industry experts on this and uh, made a comparison between two major pathways being the construction of new greenfield facilities and the refurbishment of old facilities referred to in the study as retrofitting. And I can already give away that retrofitting is the big star of the study because it uh, saves a lot of capex and also a lot of time. In the third step, we have then analyzed which facilities would be um, suitable for retrofitting them to understand how much, uh, how much of a base of facilities there is that could be retrofitted. And as a fourth step, we have looked at two scenarios. Uh, two hypothetical scenarios with the global production need of 10 million metric tons 
for 2030 and how the worldwide capacity could grow to actually answer that production, that hypothetical production need by 2030. And those two scenarios give uh, really interesting views on the role that retrofitting facilities can play. And now I would like to look at the current status quo of capacity in the market, starting with the extrusion. So the but last step in the in the value chain. And what we have done there is we have done a top-down assessment of the current capacity, which is a bit of a calculation. So we start on the left-hand side with the 2022 global plant-based meat consumption, which we estimate at 1 million metric tons. Then as the next step, we deduct from that roughly 10% of products that are not extrusion-based. That leaves, leaves us with 900 million metric tons. And then from those products, we estimate that 500 million metric tons is as an ingredient is water based on the majority of the products being produced from dry TDP, from dry structured plant protein. And then that then leads us to the 2022 production of structured plant protein of around 400 million metric tons. Then the next step is estimating the empty capacity, which we estimate between 20 to 30% in 2022. And that then gets us to the global capacity for extrusion for plant-based proteins in 2022, which we estimate at 500 million metric tons. Now we've done the same for the post-processing capacity. So for the capacity of producing final products. And again, we start on the left-hand side with the same 1 million uh, metric tons of production in 2022. But we do not need to do any deductions because, because all final products are produced in similar facilities and because all the ingredients are already present in the final product, that's why this calculation is quite a bit easier. The difference between the two, between the two is that the utilization of current capacity in post-processing is quite a bit lower. It's below 50% currently. A lot of factories are not running a second shift, for example. And that's why the global capacity estimate top down comes out at 2.2 million metric tons. We have then also done a second estimate bottom up, and really looking at the installed base of facilities worldwide. And this estimate is actually in very good agreement uh, to the top down estimation coming out at. Um, just over 2,000, uh, over 2 million metric tons. So then as a next step, we look at how we can increase capacity. And the first um, kind of more conceptual view of this is exploring all possible options of increasing the capacity for plant-based production. So one would be on the left hand side of the slide, incre increasing the productivity of existing plant based facilities. And again, that has two sub options. One would be to include the, uh, increase the throughput of the existing uh, production lines. And given that the both extrusion and post processing technologies are very well proven, we don't see a lot of potential in this area. The second one, 1.2, would be to add additional production lines to the factories. And again, we don't see a lot of um, potential there because from, from our research, we have learned that most uh, factories are well used, which means that we need to look towards new facilities if we want to substantially increase the capacity 
for production of plant-based meat. And here we have two options, as I've mentioned before. One is retrofitting existing facilities, and the other one is constructing greenfield facilities. I think greenfield facilities is quite straightforward. Uh, all you need is uh, an empty plot of land and a connection to good ut utilities and, and to logistics. For retrofit, it's a bit more complex because you need to find a facility that actually has relevant equipment in buildings. Uh, one option that where we don't see a lot of potential is the conversion of slaughterhouses. The reason we have looked at this is because in some re in some regions, uh, especially in Europe, there may there may may be a decrease of meat consumption actually, which may result in, in slaughterhouses not being used anymore more for slaughtering and therefore result in available slaughterhouses. However, this is not a good option because the all the equipment would be different. Something that is a really good option for retrofitting are extrusion-based facilities. And these facilities are usually in industries like pet food, dry snacks, breakfast cereals. And the second one that is really very suitable for retrofitting is post-processing facilities for animal meat or for fish. So just the very classic meat factories that make final processed products. Now as the next, next step, we compare the pros and cons of retrofitting an, an existing facility versus constructing a new facility. And I've mentioned before that retrofit is the star of the study. And I think the reason is quite straightforward. The capex for one thousand metric tons of capacity per year uh, for such a retrofit is between hundred thousand and six hundred thousand dollars whereas for a new facility it would be between one and three million dollars and that's a huge difference and then the second big factor is time a retrofit takes less than six months and often it's just a matter of four weeks or six weeks or even less and for a greenfield facility, it takes easily takes three years. Really depends on the geography, both for construction uh, habits, but also for uh, permission. The big difference that um, that is really on the side of greenfield facilities, of course, is operational efic efficiency, because a new newly built purpose built facility can be much more efficient especially if you already know the products you're going to produce, and especially if you have a limited number of SKUs uh, that, that are really suitable for running very efficient, highly automated production lines that can run on the same SKU for, for quite some time. On the dimension of environmental footprint, I think it's a bit of a split, a split story. Uh, using um, an existing building and equipment, of course, is very resource efficient in, when you, uh, in terms of the construction, but usually the equipment is not as resource, is not as energy efficient and the building isn't either. Whereas for a greenfield, you can really build to the new standards, you can inc include uh, modern sustainability technologies, but of course you will have a lot of emissions for uh, constructing it in the first place. So here the decision is really one that needs to be made on a case-by-case -case basis. The CapEx range that I showed on the previous slide is between one and three million, which is quite a big range. So I just wanted to say a few words about what drives this, this large range. One big driver, of course, is geography. Uh, construction costs vary a lot across the globe. I think that's quite straightforward. Number two is the equipment quality. So the equipment cost for the equipment is pretty, is very similar across the world because it's a few brands that supply the equipment, but these brands differ quite a bit in terms of quality. And you can easily have a factor of two to three between different suppliers of the same equipment. Number three is the product portfolio. 
I've mentioned before, if you're trying to produce 500 different SKUs in the same factory, the output will be much less per year compared to just producing maybe five or 10 SKUs. And that means that the capex per output or per capacity will of course be much, will be of course much higher. And then two other factors is how much of the warehousing is included in the facility. And of course, sustainability. Uh, a really good state of the art sustainable facility will include its own renewable energy sources and it will include its own wastewater treatment as well, or at least pre treatment. And that, of course, uh, adds to the capex. Now, when if we zoom in a bit on the option of retrofitting, just to understand like what kinds of facilities would be suitable for retrofitting. Um, the kind of size range should be between 5,000 and 50,000 square feet. The average of the existing facilities is at 50,000 square feet. And I think that's like a, a good size to start from. In terms of the equipment, it's quite clear. For extrusion, the facility needs to have extruders that are either already in a food grade setup or can easily be converted into a food grade setup. I mean, this, the, the food grade question is, is especially relevant for the pet food industries. The other kind of um, eligible industries uh, will already be food grade, like snacks and breakfast cereals, pasta as well. For post-processing, it needs to be a factory that has the typical post-processing equipment, like shredding, breading, and things like that to make, for example, chicken nuggets or to make sausages. And those you would usually find in the meat processing industries. In terms of output, it should be more than 3,000 tons per year. And the kind of something like 20,000, sorry, 20,000 metric tons per year, I think is the, is a large enough size to produce economically. In terms of utilities, uh, everything should be there that's uh, needed to run the, the, the equipment that's present. So it wouldn't really change from the things that have been produced before. Ideally, the factory already incorporates some sustainable technology for energy and for water. So that's in terms, that was in terms of the um, parameters for an existing facility. Now, as the next really interesting view, we look at the current production capacity of eligible facilities, which is in the tens of millions of metric tons. So on one of the first slides, we showed that the current plant-based meat production is estimated around 1 million metric tons. And in our hypothetical scenario that we will come to a bit later in this webinar, we are looking at a hypothetical a production output of 10 million metric tons. The current extrusion capacity worldwide that would be eligible for producing structured plant proteins for plant-based meat is at 34 million metric tons. So the main message is that the capacity, production capacity in other industries is gigantic and that there is plenty of potential for using that for retrofitting. And that applies both for extrusion where the overall capacity is, is something like 40 million metric tons. And then after deducting some facilities that won't quite be suitable for plant-based meat, we still have um, a, a big multiple of what would be needed for plant-based meat, even in our hypothetical scenario. And for post-processing, it's similar. It's something like 60 million metric tons that would be suitable. So even getting a small slice of that could really um, help increasing the capacity for plant-based meat. And especially 
increasing it at a rapid pace if that should be needed in the future. And with that, we come to our scenario analysis of two hypothetical scenarios. First of all, in the hypothetical scenario, we look at a worldwide production and consumption of plant-based meat in 2030 of 10 million metric tons. That means, uh, going back to the logic of one of the earlier slides, that we have a production need of 4.4 million metric tons for structured plant proteins. Again, the reason is that a lot of water is added to dry plant-based uh, structured plant structured plant protein, and therefore the, the numbers are not the same. 4 million metric tons by 2030. And if we look at the small gray bars at the bottom of the scenario, the current estimated capacity is at 0 0.5 million metric tons. So that means that the 2030 production need in this scenario is roughly 10 times higher than current capacity. And then we do the same for post-processing. Here we don't have the water added. That's why we have the full 10 million metric tons of production need in 2030. And again, in this scenario, the production need in 2030 is much higher than current capacity estimate of 2.2, so a factor of around five. If we look at 23, 2023, 2024, 2025, the existing capacity is uh, what we are showing here, just to avoid confusion, is not the, the full existing capacity, but what we are showing is how much of the production need can be covered by existing capacity. And, and what that means is that new capacity would be needed from 2026. So now this, this is the scenario of, of worldwide market demand that we just discussed, both for exclusion and for post-processing. And now we have analyzed two scenarios on how to fulfill this need by 2020, uh, by 2030. And in scenario one, we have decided to split the additional production capacity between retrofit and greenfield. So 50% of the additional capacity to come online will be created by retrofitting existing facilities from other industries. And 50% will be uh, covered by constructing new greenfield facilities. So that's the scenario number one. And in scenario number two, we are just constructing new factories, 100% greenfield. And the parameters that we have is, uh, assumed for these two scenarios are a lead time of one year for retrofit and three years for greenfield, with the one year being a number that we have chosen for modeling purposes. So in reality, I said on one of the earlier slides, it's, it's below six months normally, and often it can be done within six weeks, eight weeks. But for mod modeling purposes, we showed, uh, we assume one year. For Greenfield, we ass assume three years. And then for the CapEx, we, I talked about a range between $100,000 and $600,000. 4,000 metric tons of capacity per year. And we have settled on a medium value based on, on a lot of benchmarks that we have analyzed. We have used for this scenario analysis $300,000 for extrusion and $300,000 for post-processing. On the greenfield side, again, based on our benchmarks, we have used 1.3 million dollars for exclusion and 1.7 million dollars for post-processing. So now when we plug these numbers into our scenario analysis, we look at how capacity will be built year by year until 2030. In scenario, so let's look at the exclusion first. <clears throat> In scenario one, we are already adding new capacity in 2024 and 
the half of that will be added by retrofitting existing facilities. And the other half would be needed to refit by greenfield construction. But given that greenfield construction takes three years, it is actually not filled and there will be a capacity shortage in the market. That's the dark black color in the top left um, graph. The same will happen in 2025. There will be a need of new capacity of 0 0.3 million metric tons, and we will only be able to fill half of that with retrofitting existing facilities in this scenario. And the other half of greenfield, new greenfield capacity will only co come online uh, later because it has three years lead time. In reality, of course, so if we step away from the scenario a bit, in reality, it would, of course, make sense to retrofit as much as we need during those two years to make sure that we close the shortage in the market during those years and in parallel start constructing greenfield facilities. Then in 2026, the first greenfield facilities come online and then we will be able to actually fulfill the capacity need in the market going forward by adding new capacity every year. Of course, all of this depends on manufacturing companies um, looking ahead and planning ahead and starting their constructing the new facilities on time. Now, if you look at scenario two of extrusion, where there's no way to fit in of existing facilities, there, of course, we see larger gaps in 2024 and 2025 of 100,000 metric tons and 300,000 metric tons. And then in 2026, a large chunk of capacity comes online, which has been kind of kicked off in terms of planning and construction already in 2023 with the three years lead time. For post-processing, the situation is a bit different. As mentioned on one of the earlier slides, the current utilization is estimated at below 50%. And that's the reason why there's no new capacity needed in any of the years 2023, 24, 25. So the, the earliest new capacity need is in 2026 in this scenario. And half of that in the, in the scenario one, in the top right corner of the slide in the graph, half of that will be with retrofitting existing facilities and the other half with greenfield. And what we do in this scenario is that we anticipate that need already today. And that's why we kick off greenfield construction today. And that's why it comes online on time in 2026. In scenario two for post-processing, we rely completely on greenfield construction. But given that we anticipate the need already today, we are on time with our new greenfield facilities in 2026. Uh, right bottom corner of the slide in the graph 2026, 700,000 metric tons of capacity come online. So this is the development of the capacity that we that the market has available in this scenario. And now on the next slide, we will look at what these two scenarios mean in terms of capex. Scenario one, 50% greenfield, 50% retrofit, has a total capex need, has a total capex need of 10.4 billion US dollars. So that's on the right hand side of the slide, the gray box. And that's the capex that we need to invest by 2030 to fulfill the capacity need that that we have by 2030 in this hypothetical scenario. If we look at the bottom graph, scenario two, where we rely on greenfield construction, it's 17.5 billion, which is a big difference. So both the capex is a substantial difference, and also the lead time, as we saw in the previous slide with the capacity gaps that opened up in the greenfield only scenario, we see that we benefit a lot from retrofitting. 
We also now have the, the dark green colors in the graph. And what the dark green color indicates is the capex that we already need to invest ahead of 2030 for capacity that needs to come online after 2030 with the global consumption growing further after that date. So already between 2028 and 2030, manufacturers need to anticipate the growth after 2030 and start investing into facilities. And again, those numbers differ quite a lot between the two scenarios. And with that, also the risk differs quite a lot. So I think the key takeaway of this slide and of course also of this study is that retrofitting is really a very attractive, op attractive option for the industry. And with that, I will hand back to Pri, who will explore this in a bit more detail. Thank you, Heinrich, for walking us through the analysis and providing useful information about plant-based meat capacity. I'll summarize the key points from the report and discuss actions that industry and policy stakeholders can take moving forward. The four key takeaways of this analysis are as follows. We estimate that there's approximately 2.2 million metric tons of global plant-based meat post-processing capacity and 0.5 million metric tons of global plant-based meat extrusion capacity. Current extrusion capacity is utilized well, while post-processing capacity utilization can increase before needing additional facilities. In the 10 millimetric ton market growth scenario we modeled, there will be a total capacity gap of approximately 3.9 millimetric tons for extrusion and 7.4 millimetric tons for post-processing, resulting in capacity gaps in 2024 and 2026 respectively. As a result, even moderate market growth may outstrip the industry's ability to serve demand. Manufacturers must keep pace to avoid shortages and improve accessibility and affordability. We also demonstrate that retrofitting facilities can be an agile and affordable solution for capacity growth, where retrofitting can be up to 80% less CapEx than green field construction. On average, retrofitting requires a fifth of the capital expenditure and a third of the lead time compared to greenfield. We also recognize that greenfield construction can be the best decision for some plant-based meat producers especially in cases where manufacturers have enough capital, are okay with longer development times, and want to focus on optimizing their long-term operational efficiency. Manufacturers focused on greenfield construction should take advantage of their bottom-up development and implement sustainable technologies such as on-site renewable energy and effective wastewater treatment systems, as well as automated technologies to lower production costs. Finally, our report highlights opportunities for incumbent industries to apply part of their infrastructure for production of plant-based meats. Companies can easily diversify their product portfolios, as I'll highlight in the next slide. For those looking to proactively and conscientiously expand global production capacity, GFI has also provided two supplementary reports to this analysis with de detailed action recommendations for specific stakeholders. I'll briefly summarize the recommendation actions from these papers. These results have obvious implications for industry stakeholders. Whether they are manufacturers and in other industries thinking about pivoting into the plant-based space or plant-based manufacturers considering capacity build-out. As, as the demand for plant-based meat grows in challenging market conditions, the need for modular, agile solutions are necessary to embed plant-based meats within resilient food product portfolios. Those interested in expanding their capacity to include plant-based meat manufacturing can, can, can consider co-manufacturing or full-time retrofit. So manufacturers in pet food, pasta, breakfast cereals, and dry snack industries should consider acting as contract manufacturers for the plant-based meat industry. In our 10 mil, million metric mar, a ton market scenario growth, Satisfying half of the demand with retrofitting would be equivalent of repurposing just 5% of existing suitable extrusion facilities. The extent to which the scenario is realistic depends on a lot of unknowns, including growth and profit margins of the original industries compared to plant-based meat, but it definitely demonstrates low-hanging fruit for incumbent industries to get involved in the plant-based space. 
Manufacturers can also consider retro retrofitting for full-time plant-based meat production. So in industries whose sales and margins are maybe under pressure, retrofitting for plant-based meat production may provide an avenue for margin improvement in regions experiencing plant-based meat market growth. Similarly, existing plant-based meat produ producers should seek opportunities to purchase or lease facilities in industries facing such situations as cost-effective methods to scale capacity. And for those looking to further expand their footprint in the alt protein industry, we recommend exploring all potential avenues for growing expansion. This can include expanding existing facilities, um, retrofitting from suitable industries, partnering with a contract manufacturer, especially for post-processing, we see that the current capacity utilization can definitely be optimized before exploring other options like greenfield construction or retrofitting. As mentioned before, but worth reiterating here, it is important to emphasize efficiency and optimization for greenfield projects. And of course, we recommend that any manufacturer should focus on reducing prices without satisfying the quality of their products. Companies can improve the costs of their plant-based meat production through an increased willingness to explore retrofitting opportunities and more efficient greenfield production. And finally, more transparent information about manufacturing capacity can help the industry grow as a whole and help companies to capitalize on potential contract manufacturing opportunities. For more details about these action recommendations, please dive into our industry stakeholder action paper. And in the spirit of our last recommendation of more actively sharing capacity information, please consider including your facility information in GFI's contract manufacturing database. Additionally, if you're interested in finding a contract manufacturer, contracting a pilot scale facility, or finding a contract consultant, this can be a good resource for you. Governments also have an important role in playing um, a, a, an important role to play in building pathways for plant-based meat manufacturing. Governments have the opportunity to de-risk the production of plant-based meats while investors and manufacturers develop more confidence in the plant-based meat market. They can do this by offering financial incentives for greenfield construction that increase production of plant-based meats. Governments should map costs, benefits, and risks for tax incentive-driven deals and employ debt financing for large infrastructure projects for plant-based meats. Similar tax breaks, financing, and other incentives have been leveraged for other climate forward industries like electric cars. Additionally, governments can offer more incentives and financing for new contract manufacturing partnerships and other retrofits that support plant-based meat production. Because of retrofitting costs and lead time advantages, tax incentives and debt financing for retrofit projects could expedite and lower the costs of plant-based meat production expansion. These incentives would also encourage company product portfolio diversification. Governments should lead and leverage public-private collaborations between public, private companies and academic institutes that support the scale-up of plant-based foods. In addition to providing more infrastructure and opportunities for optimizing scale-up, public research for these collaborations would reduce industry-wide research duplication by sharing foundational solutions with a wider audience. And finally, adding to the point discussed previously about capacity transparency, policymakers can provide mechanisms and incentives for capacity transparency. Governments that are interested in food security and environmental sustainability should seriously consider financing plant-based meat scale-up and begin planning as soon as possible. While a report highlights that pathways to capacity expansion are long and require significant investment, Governments have the opportunity to de-risk this nascent industry and become global plant protein leaders. For more details about the action recommendations, please dive into our policy stakeholder action paper. And the main report itself dives into further details about facility selection criteria, the methodology involved in this analysis, and much more. So I encourage you to download the report and the action recommendation papers as well. And for those um, interested in even more resources from GFI, please sign up for our alt protein opportunity newsletter at gfi.org slash insider. And thank you so much for your attention. We'll be happy to answer any questions. I see that we have quite a few in the chat already. So I'll stop sharing my screen and we can move into the Q and a portion. Yeah, maybe that was an interesting question about the split between high moisture 
um, extrusion based structured plant protein and low moisture based and i think yeah. this is this is one of the really interesting um, hidden variables in the market so our current estimate is that 15 percent of the current plant-based production is based on what i would call wet extrusion so high moisture extrusion and 85 percent is actually based on low moisture extrusion high moisture extrusion is is a growing category I think it's clear that there is growth in the market, but it's not as, um, how do you say, it's not as as strong as as we would maybe hope for the for the quality of product. So, in our hypothetical scenario, we have assumed a share of thirty percent for twenty thirty. That makes sense. Yes. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much for answering that. And we've definitely seen the same on the GFI side. I'm talking to experts as well. Um, Heinrich, I was wondering if um, you'd be willing to answer this question about how many such facilities providing extruders for plant-based meat exists globally and how many extruders currently exist and are utilized for plant-based meat. I know that this is a very difficult question to this answer. Is, um, <laughs> indeed, this is a really difficult one. So if we Think back to the 1 million metric tons of plant-based meat production globally for 2022. And then we look to the, then we think back of the number of 40 million metric tons of extrusion-based products in other industries. And we see that, that plant-based meat is only really a tiny portion of the extrusion products. And actually a lot of Extrusion facilities are quite versatile, so it's not 100% clear which facilities are actually producing the structured plant protein for plant-based meat and which are producing for other purposes. So it's really difficult to find out. So we have restraint uh, for making estimates on this because we didn't feel we have enough confidence to actually uh, tell you a number that that we that we feel is good enough to be to be published. Yes, absolutely. And speaking to that as well, um, ingredient processing um, capacity is also incredibly important, but that additionally was very difficult data to find um, because most people who are producing these protein ingredients aren't just doing it just for the plant-based meat industry. Um, so it definitely talks more to just more transparency in the um, in the industry as a whole can hopefully elevate us as a whole. Um, and please let us know if you're interested in um, providing any additional information about your ingredient processing or extruder facilities. Um, please take a look at the capacity manufacturing database um, that was linked in the slides as well. Um, next up, I would love to take this question, um, which I love. Uh, which countries are providing incentives or subsidies to invest in retrofitting and greenfield production? Um, so first of all, I would definitely recommend you take a look at our government action paper. Um, it goes into a lot more detail about what existing public financing there is for the plant-based meat industry. Um, just to kind of level set us, as, as of the end of 2021, there was approximately $360 million all-time global alternative protein R&D investment. So that's every country up until 2021, all combined is just shy of $400 million. And um, just for comparison, uh, Rivian, which is an electric car company, received a $1.5 billion package with just the state of Georgia to build an electric vehicle plant. So that's a one project for 1.5 billion versus the all time, just shy of $400 million all time global public alternative protein investment. So we can see that there's a lot of growth to be made and hopefully um, governments will be interested in in investing in this space so that we can really make it a climate solution. Um, the governments that have been doing a really great job of stepping up and offering um, public investment for this space include Canada. So um, Canada does invest um, in, a, a, in an innovation supercluster, Protein Industries Canada, um, that works with private industry for plant-based protein projects, including infrastructure, um, for instance, they invested $19.5 million um, in Protein Industries Canada recently. 
In Australia, there has been funding for $113 million um, to build three new plant protein manufacturing facilities. And in uh, Sweden, too, we see that there's a $91 million um, funding that was partially given from the Swedish government to build a large-scale pea protein production facility. Um, so if you would like to see more examples of that, um, please explore the action paper. Additionally, GFI has does release global state of the um, policy reports. Um, we should have one coming up in a few months, so I would keep an eye out for that. And then we have one that came out last year that is incredibly interesting and has some um, pretty recent numbers as well. Excellent. Um, and so with that, I think um, the next question, Heinrich, if you're um, comfortable with answering it, is um, do you have an estimate of the plant-based facilities available that are 100% plant-based production with no meat or animal products? Are these capacities included in what you showed? And I think this definitely speaks back to your answer about extruders, but I would love to hear what you have to say. <laughs> yeah, I think the situation is, is slightly different, actually. If we if we think of slide 15, maybe we can even pull it up to, to support this a bit. So when we did the bottom-up analysis of post-processing capacity, we found that we found two things, I would say, that a lot of facilities are already exclusive for plant-based meat because brands want to be able to boast of their products having been produced in a completely vegan factory. And then the second thing that came up is that the number of these facilities is increasing because as a core manufacturer, not being able to guarantee to your clients that no animal DNA will be found in any of the products is becoming more and more important to, for actually winning uh, co-manufacturing contracts. So of the facilities shown here in this analysis, my personal estimate would be that around 80% of them are producing exclusively plant-based, which I think is a, is a really a strong number and a really encouraging number. Excellent. Thank you so much for that, Heinrich. Okay, here we go. Heinrich, um, here's another question for you. What are the drivers to decide for an extrusion greenfield versus post-processing greenfield investment? Yeah, so I think, I think, so I will start with extrusion. So it's not extrusion versus post-processing, right? It depends on what you as a company want to produce, whether you are more on the structured plant protein side or whether you're on the final product side. So I think for, for both of them, it's, it's their individual stories for extrusion. I think it's, it really depends on how specific your exclusion methods are. So if we think of high moisture exclusion, the kind of level of technology of extruders that you need is, is much more specific than, than for low moisture. And then for, for low moisture extrusion, I think it's, it's crucial to have a twin screw extruder. So the facility should be based on twin screw extruders, which a lot of facilities are. I know there's also single screw extrusion in pet foods, but generally across the industries uh, that we have looked at, pasta and breakfast cereals and snacks, there are a lot of twin screw extruders in, in current facilities already. So that's one. And then the, the other one to look at is kind of how old the buildings are and how old the extruders are and how, how much investment for converting them to the standard that you want now, how much investment is needed for that. And then on the post-processing side, I think there's a, a big question around, do the products that I want to produce match with the equipment that is in the facility already? So let's say the facility has been making sausages mainly, but you want to make chicken nuggets, then you have to swap a lot of the equipment. And then uh, it's, it's a question whether it makes sense to use that factory. And then another really big thing in post-processing is the number of SKUs that you're looking at and the level of flexibility in the factory. So if you are looking to produce super efficiently at the lowest possible cost with a limited number of SKUs that you can anticipate for the future, 
then it really makes sense to make a greenfield facility and and try to automate it as much as possible and have it run pretty much 24 7. and there are some products like uh, one big example is chicken nuggets these uh, production lines exist almost off the shelf for producing them uh, fully automated and if you are like many of the co-manufacturers that that we see in in smaller markets today super flexible able to make almost anything um and, and in, in small batches as well then it's probably worth looking at, at existing facilities because you can save a lot of money especially if you don't know what you're producing tomorrow exactly wonderful and um for this one someone asked globally what countries are best positioned to meet production capacity via retrofit i don't know if we can get to countries but i think we might have some regional information on that yes so i think this one is less to do with technology and it's probably more to do with demands in other markets so in i think in, in really strongly growing markets uh, regarding animal meat uh, finding facilities for retrofit is quite a bit harder than in, in geographies where the meat market isn't growing as, as much anymore. So in Asia, where meat is really growing really quickly, it will be much harder to just find facilities that you can buy for a decent price or to have them in your portfolio already. Whereas in Europe, where the growth of animal meat is, is actually quite limited, it will be much easier. Yes, absolutely. Um... And then this one, I will, um, I'll take this question since I, I get asked it all the time, but, um, we are working hard on plant-based meat. Do you think people accept it? What is our duty regarding this issue? Um, you know, this is a, a big crux of what my position is at GFI. Um, you know, how can we make plant-based meat just so tasty, so affordable and so convenient that people just can't say no to it. Right. Um, so I think right now where we're at with plant-based meat, um, the acceptance rates aren't there. We want more repeat penetration into households and the ways to do that are by making them even tastier and even more affordable and even more convenient. Um, so I think what our duty is, is to just remember the, that trifecta of how to actually get a nascent product into people's homes and get them to repeat by them. Um, you know, people won't accept a bad product. So don't put bad products out there and then have folks, you know, taste that bad product and then just be turned off by the whole entire space in general. We really do want to be mindful to keep focusing on enhancing taste, making it more affordable, making it more convenient rather than putting a lot of the same types of products out onto the space. Um, so I definitely think people will accept it. Eventually, we still have a lot of hard work to do. Hybrid products can definitely be very helpful with precision fermentation, other types of fermentation, as well as, as cultivated meat. Um, but our duty is just to, to keep making sure that we work really hard to make really good products. And um, eventually, people will have to accept. Um, I showed that chart of meat demand by 2050, we don't have the carrying capacity to get that far with animal agriculture to the, with the tools that we have right now. So diversifying our protein supply will definitely be incredibly helpful for that and something that we need to do. And um, hopefully industry will step up to make those really fantastic products that people can't say no to. Excellent. Okay. And then with that, um, I'm wondering, Heinrich, would you be willing to speak on the differences between the economics and other dynamics for alt meat for pets? Um, I'm not sure how much information you might have on that. We had a couple questions um, of just what the alt meat for pets versus human fo foods look like, and what is the capacity for ramping up alt meat production for pets? Yeah, so I think I think this is a is a difficult one because it really depends on the specific factory in question. Because also between like across the range of pet pet food facilities, the technology there varies quite a bit. So I think that I don't think there is like a one size fits all answer. But it re so the main point is having the right extruders. So it's all about having twin screw extruders. Once you have them. It's uh, only the second question that you need to answer um, and solve is the food grade one. And and I know that a lot of pet food facilities are already food grade. So I think 
I think twin screw extruders is the key thing for repurposing that facility for plant based. And I will mention, um, as I said at the conclusion slide, our report goes into a lot of detail about criteria selection and it includes some equipment information. Um, one thing that I thought that really stood out is that updating an existing extruder is about 50% of the cost of a new extruder. Um, so that's in our report. Um, take a look for even more details like that. That can be really helpful for kind of deciding, um, you know, if you are moving from pet foods into human consumption space, what types of updates you might need in order to do that. Um, absolutely. So thank you so much, Heinrich, for that. Um, and please keep on asking questions. We definitely have time. We have 10 more minutes and just a few more questions to get through. So please, anything that's on your mind, um, I'm sure if you have a question, somebody else has that same question. Um, next, I'll move on to this question about are there existing facilities that are extruding cell-based and plant-based proteins? Um, plant-based proteins, absolutely. Um, Heinrich did a wonderful job of showing our estimates of what facilities are doing that with plant proteins. Um, the types of plant proteins that people are extruding right now that are more popular are of course uh, soy and pea and wheat. Um, wheat gluten in, this, in particular can give a really good structure um, as well to plant-based protein um, meats. Um, as far as cell base goes, this is a very interesting question. To my knowledge, and hopefully, um, you know, if one of my uh, cultivated meat experts happens to be on this call, they can either confirm or deny this. I don't believe that we're doing cell based extrusion quite yet. Um, that being said, I definitely know of a few academic researchers and industry um, companies that are looking at using structured plant proteins for a scaffold for cell-based um, meat or cultivated meat. Um, so while we might not be feeding the cells directly into the extruder right now, um, we definitely use a texturized vegetable protein for scaffolding for cultivated meat. Additionally, some folks are even looking towards 3D printing, um, which can sometimes be kind of viewed as like a micro extruder um, for cell-based um, products. So people are definitely looking at ways to texturize the cell-based products, but I'm not completely um, sure if we're doing cultivated um, cells directly into the extruder quite yet. Heinrich, do you yeah. have any information yeah, on that? Yeah, so actually, I, I have touched uh, this question recently, and, and I can completely confirm that I don't know of anybody who's doing that at the moment. I mean, to, to be honest, the current cost for, for actually product, producing cells is quite high, so we haven't really reached the scale of starting extrusion. But I know that a few people are looking also at uh, produ producing cell-based uh, meat alternatives using extrusion. So I think there's probably a lot of interesting things to look out in the future. Wonderful. I'm happy that you did the the homework to my claim. Um, <laughs> so, um, okay, this one I'd be happy to touch on too, but I think Heinrich, you'll have some really interesting answers for this. Based on your experience, what are the key cost drivers in downstream production? Yes. So cost drivers and downstream production, the, the, the really big driver is, is efficiency. I think that's the one, number one driver. And that's like, it's all about this example that I, that I mentioned about this fully automated chicken, chicken nuggets line that runs 24 seven. And then on the one kind of end of the spectrum. And then on the other end of the spectrum is a, is a super flexible factory that has a lot of different equipments that are moved around on a daily basis to produce quite different SKUs. And that will then in, in, in include a lot of labor and it will also uh, include a lot of underutilized equipment. So in general, the cost of the factory should be a kind of 50-50 kind of labor and, and CapEx uh, cost. But the the labor portion and also the capex utilization portion really 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 depends on the on the efficiency and i think this is also one of the major challenges on the cost side for the industry that often volumes are not big enough to produce at the right scale and therefore hit the right cost and 
And I know that this is a really tough one for manufacturers because their customers, the retailers and brands, expect a wide, a wide variety of SKUs from their manufacturers at quite small batch sizes. And, and that's, that's really a big challenge that I think will get easier as the industry grows. Yes, absolutely. I completely agree. And again, um, just a tidbit that I really like from our report that I'll quote here and um, again, encourage you to dive in deeper for even more details. Um, looking at the CapEx, it's about 50% is estimated just for equipment, 35% for building and utilities, and 15% in direct costs. So um, we definitely see that equipment can be a huge cost driver. And as Heinrich pointed out earlier in the presentation, um, comparing prices can make a big difference where some of the more affordable equipment might be two to three times less expensive than some of the top line equipment. Of course, you don't want to sacrifice quality at all, but um, taking a look at those and, and being mindful of perhaps retrofitting equipment or um, using some used equipment might be a good pathway for um, reducing costs as well. Okay. Um, let's see here. We have definitely time for a couple more questions. Um, Heinrich, you touched upon this in the presentation, but would love a more detailed answer here. Could future extrusion manufacturing needs be answered by making extrusion product lines more efficient? If so, by what factor? Yeah, so I don't expect a lot of potential there. And the simple reason is that extrusion is not something that's been invented uh, recently, but more something that the that various industries have been using for, for many years. And therefore, I don't expect like any step change there. For new capacity, is a bit different. So the size of extruders has, uh, or the throughput of the new models of extruders coming online has increased quite a bit. But um, the, the, the extruders themselves, like the existing lines, there's not too much potential. Sometimes uh, things, something can be done by working on the die, on the cooling die. And, and making that more powerful. But in general, I don't see a lot of potential with existing extruders. Yeah, absolutely. I think from a, a scalability point of view, um, that seems to be the agreement amongst experts right now. Um, there was a follow-up uh, question about, are, you, are any such efforts familiar to you aimed at making extrusion more efficient? I would love if um, we were proven wrong here, I would love if somebody would step up and make a high throughput extruder that can produce scale um, much better than what we have now. I know people are incrementally working on this and I really, I, I want this to be part of the future. I think that, you know, we can see that so much investment, so much infrastructure is needed for the way that we currently texturize plant-based protein. So any of the innovations that can either reduce equipment use, um, reduce energy use can definitely be really, really helpful here. Um, I've definitely seen a few examples of folks doing, um, as Heinrich mentioned, some really innovative things with the cooling die, um, as well as some software engineering um, for how to control the different parameters within the extruder to then control the texturization. So a lot of these efficiencies are more aimed towards making a better texture. Um, through extruder extrusion, but not necessarily doing it at higher throughput at a bigger scale. Um, so adding anything that that could do that would be a really break, big breakthrough for the industry. If anyone has any ideas and wants to chit chat about it, um, my mailbox is definitely open for that. Um, that's something that I think will be really, really important um, if we can do it. Um, but obviously, we also have extrusion as a um, great technology that's tried and true. and um, uh, our most scalable solution right now. Okay. Um, oh, okay. That one, um, was very specific. Let's see here. Um, Heinrich, this is probably going to be our last question here. Um, question is, can we build production using profits from the AP industry? May it be a good opportunity to discuss the role of manufacturing to reach price parity? You just need to help me with what is what is meant by AP industry. 
Apologies. So um, they're saying, okay, can we use the profits from the alternative protein industry to um, build out more capacity um, to um, to actually uh, uh, make this infrastructure? Is that a possibility? Yes. yes. So, so currently, a lot of manufacturers are actually struggling with prof profitability. So I think for actually growing capacity at a, at a good pace, we should not just rely on, on, on profits already. I mean, this is a growing industry and growing industries need investment. They cannot just run on the, on the cash that they're generating themselves as a general kind of economical rule, right? So I think it would be unwise to try and rely on, on cash that's currently generated by the industry itself. And it would be wiser to invest looking to the future, both from companies, but also from, from public bodies. Uh, to make the growth possible that that may be needed at some point and not to kind of get behind the game. I completely agree. This is a nascent industry and needs as much support as possible from investors, um, both public and private, and having more collaborations across public and private sectors to to really uplift it and and get that mass adoption. Um, okay, with that, I would love to wrap up this webinar. Thank you all again for your attention. We're so proud of this report and happy to share it with you all. Um, thank you, Bright Green Partners. You guys were fantastic to work with. And um, we hope everybody has a great week.